Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Han Johnston, and I'm the membership person for Self-Directed Support Scotland. I'm going to talk to you this morning about some research that we are currently undertaking, which is looking at people's experience of accessing independent information and support services for self-directed support in Scotland. So we've snappily called it the By My Side research. Just to give you a little bit of context to the research, previously there was a large scale piece of research which has already been mentioned this morning, um, looking at people's experience of accessing self-directed support called My Support, My Choice. Um, and this ran for over a year, almost sort of 18 months. In addition, there was also a review of independent information and support services undertaken in 2018. So it's been a few years since we've actually had any research that's looking at people's experience around independent support. We knew from My Support, My Choice that independent support um, made self-directed support easier for people. People told us lots of positive things about um, the importance of self-directed support for them. However, we wanted to find out what people's recent experience of accessing ind independent support has been like, particularly since the pandemic. Um, maybe I could just kind of clarify, first of all, what we really mean and how are we defining this term independent support? Because it's a term maybe for a lot of people, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to everybody. Um, so we were tr um, wanted to include people's experience of accessing a wide and varied range of different types of groups and organizations, ranging from quite specialist SDS information support services that might be funded by support in the right direction, for example, but also to include advocacy services, carer centres, brokerage services, and also peer support groups. We also wanted to be clear that this was not about support provided by public sector organisations like local authorities or the NHS, or support provided by care providers. So it's very much looking at the independent sector. So the aims, and, and what were the aims and objectives of, of the research? I would like to say that we're currently right in the middle of this research at the moment, so it's very much live and it's very much ongoing. Um, we wanted to understand what good quality support looks like for people using social care services and unpaid carers. We wanted to understand what people valued the most from independent support and what difference that made to them and how accessible this is for people. We also wanted to understand if there were any gaps in local provision and what is needed to support independent support in the future. We would then be looking to make recommendations based on the information that people were telling us about their experience. Um, so to help sort of plan and deliver the research, we set up a project advisory group made up of people using social care services, unpaid carers and people from independent support organisations across Scotland. In practical terms, the research is primarily based on a survey. We have a nice example of the survey here with a nice easy read version as well. Um, we do like to have a survey at SDS Scotland. This is available online. And like I say, we've got the paper versions as well. And we've also ar arranged online focus group discussions as part of trying to enable people to share their experience in different ways. We've got some initial data, and this is what I'm going to be trying to show you today, some of the trends and some of that initial data that we've currently received. So, so far, we've had responses from almost all local authority areas in Scotland. There's still a few to go. Um, at the moment, the highest level of responses come from Scottish borders, way out in front, followed by City of Edinburgh and then Eastern Bartonshire. We also asked people a series of questions within the survey um, uh, and, start, that started to, uh, and started by asking people about the type of independent support that they've used in the last 12 months. So we wanted to focus on more recent experience. So far, the, um, the top three organisations that support that people have had support from are firstly that, those kind of specialist SDS information and support services that are third funded, a carer centre, and an advocacy service. We're also finding that people are receiving support from more than one organization as well. So it's not just um, specifically just one particular organization. We asked people how they found out about independent support and overwhelmingly, 45%, uh, most people found out from a social worker or someone in their local authority. 
After that came a friend or family member or another organisation. Included in that other kind of um, box that we had included people like solicitors and care providers as well. We asked people why they were looking to access independent support from an independent organisation. And most people, 43%, said they were looking for general information about social care and self-directed support. A significant number, 26%, were looking for support with an assessment of their needs. And a smaller number, 8%, 8% were looking for support to, be, to become a personal assistant employer. So what support has kind of helped people the most? So we asked people to tell us about the support that has helped them the most. I've included some quotes here because I think this, this brings to life some of the, the actual experience people are trying to share with us. Um, so one person, for example, told us what helped them the most was the help with the budget and han handheld through option one. As it is so daunting, I would have refused to go this route, but the help I got meant everything is set up so I only need to monitor it. So that importance around support around option one and becoming a PA employer. Another person said, explaining the process, giving advice on how it applies to our situation, helping me explain the care needs my son has so that others will understand, giving me confidence to approach social work to ask for an assessment. So that support, maybe pre-contact with social work, that support around certain important aspects of the kind of journey to SDS around the assessment process. So some of the quotes um, about what supported people uh, uh, the most include, um, so somebody said, peer support group, so uh, peer group support has been most beneficial. Being a member of the peer support group is invaluable. The support is empathetic and someone invariably, invariably has had experience or can make a suggestion as to where to go to get more information or make suggestions as to how to tackle a problem. So I think it's really important that actually it shows that there's a real variation in the kind of support that people are, are accessing. Another person stated, I am not good with money. So my independent support organization came to help me with the misspend. The worker has been able to reduce my debt and put my voice across, as well as move me over from option one to two to help me still get, get support, but without the stress of holding the budget. So tackling real kind of significant maybe issues that people might be facing. So for me, these highlight the kind of variety of the type of support that is most helpful to people and also what support might involve, be involved in practical terms. We also asked people in the survey to rate a series of statements about what independent support helps them with the most. So for example, 73% of people agreed that independent support helped them to understand what self-directed support was about, what it meant. 63% of people agreed that it helped them to uphold their rights. And 64% of people agreed that independent support helped them to have a real choice over their social care support. We then asked people to tell us overall how helpful had accessing independent support been to them. 54% of people actually rated independent support as being essential for them. It was a pretty strong thing to say. 26% of people rated independent support as being very helpful. So quite a significant number, 80% of the people so far are telling us how important independent support is to enable them to access and make use of self-directed support. We also wanted to understand if there were any difficulties that people might face when trying to access independent support. So far, the responses include sort of 18% of people saying that they found it difficult to contact a local organization. 15% of people told us that there was a waiting list for support. So that was something maybe I wasn't really that aware of. 12% of people have told us that their local organization cannot support them through the whole process of getting social care support, that idea of end-to-end -end support. So we need to understand, really as part of this kind of research, if there are any factors affecting these experience, and we hope to identify some of these through people's responses. We also ask people what would make it easier for them to use independent support services in the future. So far, the responses are 52% of people want clearer information about what, what support is available. 20% of people want an easy way to find independent support. And 14% of people want to be told about independent support by their local council or NHS. So we heard people 
a lot of people being told by the council and uh, local authority about um, independent support, but also there's still a group of people who would like to hear that from their local authorities. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I was going to try and identify sort of three main th themes that we're kind of picking up at the moment through the research that, we, uh, that are coming out of this so far, they would be firstly the importance of independent support in enabling people to access self-directed support and the variety of the support that people are using. Secondly, the value that people place on being able to access independent support, how essential this is for people, and that people still face challenges in finding independent support that's available to them locally. Okay, that's a little bit of a whistle-stop tour of, a, of our survey so far and, and some of the kind of responses we're getting, but I'd just like to send a big thank you at the moment to say really thank you for any, everyone who's taken part so far, shared their experience, completed a survey, particularly the project advisory group that is helping with kind of planning and the development of the survey and promoting this so far. And finally, just to say, you know, the survey is here. It is open. People want to take part. It's live. You can do that now online. You can request a paper copy. Um, it'll take you 10 minutes over the Easter holiday. And apparently it goes pretty well with a coffee and a hot cross bun. Um, so thank you very much for, for listening. Very happy to take questions. Thank you, Mark. That was really interesting. Are there any questions from, from anybody? Hello. Hello, me. Thanks. Hi, Mark. I just wondered what the process will be for distilling all of the information from the survey into some recommendations, and is there anything obvious emerging already in terms of what you might be recommending? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, well, first of all, we want to make sure that we take account of everybody's responses. So at the moment, we are still receiving quite a, quite a lot of responses coming back, um, paper copies that have only sent out a couple of weeks ago, so we're still getting that, that information coming in. So we definitely want to wait until we get most of that back. Um, I think in terms of recommendations, um, I think there might be how do we... Um, potentially su su uh, address some of the barriers that are being identified. So how do people, wh what is the, the challenge that people face to, to understanding who their local support organisation is, how they get in touch with them, um, what information are people needing? So if we can make some recommendations around either the type of information, the point at which people might be able to receive that information, who could be providing that, who could do more to help provide that in some way, so I think there's certainly something about the initial access to independent support. There's also a little bit of information around the type of conversations people are having with independent support organisations and whether those conversations could be improved in some way. So I think we'd, we'd, we'd like to pick out any of those themes uh, around barriers and challenges that people face to help independent organise not just independent support organisations, but other organisations, particularly like your local authority, your social work department, who are looking to signpost and connect people with independent support, is there anything else that they could do that might help in that journey? Um, so um, w I remain open to, um, yeah, whatever people tell us, and, and hopefully we can, uh, even if people are giving <coughs> us um, kind of, um, m maybe not... Uh, maybe not lots of people telling us the same thing. If it's something significant, it would be useful for us to highlight. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? We've got one that's come through online, but does anybody else have a question? Hello, Donna. Thank you. Mark, what have you noticed in terms of your community? I'm quite shocked by, sorry, even louder. Um, yeah, just interesting that stat, about 15% waiting to, to have access to independent support. We know if it's essential, and people need it, if you're still waiting at that point before you even maybe accessed a local authority, I think that's a deep concern for all of us. I'm not expecting you to answer it, Mark, but I just think it's a pretty shocking statistic, actually, really. Well, I think it's interesting to hear that independent support organisations might be dealing with, but is that a, a question around capacity and how much resource that they have to be able to respond to local need for access to independent support? So if there's a greater level of need, how, do we re how is that recognised? How is that recorded? If there's a gap, then 
where does that information go and who can do something about that? So I might, I might not be the person with the answers, but I might be able to ask the questions and, uh, in order for some people, particularly in an area for local independent support organisations with them, maybe the local authority and other, and other relevant people, people with lived experience and unpaid carers coming together to look at what can we do about this on a local level now that we're aware that there might be a challenge to accessing the support people really need. It's a really interesting question and certainly Donna from our independent support organisation in Highland, we, we did for a short period of time have a waiting list of 10 weeks for people to have first contact with us. That's since come down. But yeah, it's a really, really significant issue. Um, and it'd be really good to pull some learning to find out how best to meet that, that need. Um, hello, Cindy, down here in the front, and then we'll come to Donald. Hi there, Cindy. Um, I'm chairperson of Centre for Inclusive Living in Perth and Kinross, but I'm also a person with lived experience. Um, just dawned to me as you were talking there, um, with carers allowance, I have basically different levels of care um, for husband, son, daughter and nephew um, and sort of niece sometimes. Uh, but you only get one carers allowance, um, not expecting one for everybody, but I'm just using that as an example. So if you get independent living fund and SDS, can you get that as an unpaid carer and the person you're caring for? Um, or is it just one of you gets it? Do you know what I mean? That's a very good question. I'm probably not the right person to <laughs> answer that question. It's just a question to put out there. I'm not of course, an instant yeah. answer, but it's just an interesting question out there, really. Cindy, it might be worth us looking to see if we can get back to you after the event with an answer if we can't answer that today. So, John, you spotted somebody else that wanted... Ah, brilliant. Thank you. Hello. I'm hello. Ian. Oh, hello. I'm Ian Stones. Hello, Ian. I'm a Centre of Learning Disability Group in Aberdeen. <coughs> and actually, I'm just wondering, people who actually live on their own, what's got a disability? You know, what can need to have help? You know, how do we go about it with SD, SD, uh, DS, uh, things? where you're not entitled to it. So how do you get help in the way for for help for for things, you know, for finding out what you're entitled to? That's a really good question, actually, Ian. And I think possibly one thing to say, maybe just in terms of any support people feel they have around kind of social care and around independent living, in your local area, hopefully there is a local SDS information and support service funded that might be one, one place to start, to possibly go to them and, and see if they are aware of any other support that might be available in your local community and connect you with that. If you were in a role of an unpaid carer, maybe your carer centre would also be able to do that in terms of helping you with adult carer support plans, young carer statements, and any other support that potentially might be available. Um, so, yeah, I think it's about um, potentially, yes, finding someone you can have that conversation with so you can look at possible other sources of information and support for you because I appreciate you're right, not everybody is going to be eligible for funding to pay for social care support, but there might be other organisations locally and it's having that connection with that local organisation. So if you don't know how to find them, you can do a search in our database on the website um, and it'll come up with a list of organis independent organisations in your local area. So hopefully you'll find somebody that you can contact. Okay. We've got a couple more hands going up. I just want to check with Kaylee how we're doing for time. Five more minutes, okay. So if we could come to Donald with the online question, then the lady over there in blue, and I think I saw somebody else further forward that wanted to ask a question. Hi there, Mark. Um, just online, there's a few comments coming in. Um, just a couple of quick cl questions for clarity, really. Sharon Napier's asking, are SDS support organisations not funded through SIBD included in the research? Yes, oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we tried to um, encourage independent support organisations to support the research and to send surveys and information out to people that they know and have had contact with, as well as other organisations. So we have local authority representation, our project advisory group. So we've tried to, tried to reach people through different means and different organisations. Um, and a lot of the you know, advocacy services, carer centres, <coughs> other organisations and groups that we know of that we've tried, to, we've approached and tried to and 
to share the details of the research with. I think if people still have organizations and groups that would like to share their experience, you've still got time to do that and to get in touch with us and to let us know. And we can share, uh, share further information so you can share with people that you know. Because yes, we, we've, we're very keen to hear, ab hear about your experience wherever you are. And another point Sharon's making is that, um, is this also for people who are accessing indeport, independent support organisations that aren't eligible for SDS because support organisations work with all. So yes, I think it's the answer to that, Sharon. Yes, that's right. I mean, some organisations are, uh, are certainly funded to support people who are not eligible uh -huh. for self-directed support funding. So there are organisations around and it is about finding them on a local basis. So like I say, we can do, you can do that search through our, our database on our website um, and uh, yeah, we'll certainly try and con connect people uh, in your local area if you if you do get in touch with us and you're looking for more information. Thanks, Matt. And just lastly, Pandora Summerfield saying mm -hmm. um, perhaps there's an opportunity for some joint promotion by the sub-funded organisations. Yeah, well, that sounds great. Thank you. So if we could have the last question from, from the lady over there in blue, thank you. Thank you. It's actually um, very similar to what was being discussed there. Um, we're uh, the Community Brokerage Network are funded through CERD and we're actually seeing an increasing number of people coming to us who aren't eligible for formal social care that we are working with. And I think that is tying in very much to the increase um, in wait times to offer support to people because there's far more people coming through the door that um, maybe wouldn't have done previously. So um, there is funding through CERD um, for organisations, um, you know, to, to work with people that don't have um, an SDS budget, but that is having a knock-on impact on the waiting times and, and access to support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was Great. really interesting, and it'll be really interesting to see how the research develops as it moves forward. So, yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you.